Welcome back to Harbour Unbox. Today we're checking out the VRM thermal performance of a few high-end Z390 motherboards. Uh, not this many, I, I, I will eventually get through this many and many more, but today we're just doing four. We're looking at fairly high-end boards from ASUS, ASRock, MSI and Gigabyte. They're all priced around $300 US. Now, before I jump into the test results, let's just quickly go over each of these motherboards, have a look at the cooling, and then of course the VRM layout and design. I'll start with the Tai Chi Ultimate. Just grab it from over here, it's quite a heavy board. So this is ASRock's most premium Z390 board, currently costs $290 US, and it offers some really neat features. You've got 10 gigabit networking, so yeah, some really cool stuff on board, but of course, we are here for the VRM. Covering the components are two slabs of aluminium with a few slots cut into them to help maximize surface area and capture a little more airflow. You wouldn't want to rely on them too heavily, so hopefully we have some high quality components on board. Removing four spring-loaded screws, the heat sinks come off and we find some pretty typical looking thermal pads. What I'm more interested in though are those 10 5x6mm power stages, which make up the V-Core VRM. These are Texas Instruments CSD 87350 power stages, rated for up to 40 amps, but are 90% efficient at just 25 amps. They're connected to an IR35201 controller, an eight phase controller, though here just five phases are used. Each are then doubled using an IR3598 phase doubler. The actual V-Core configuration looks like this. Here we have a combined peak current capacity of 400 amps or 250 amps at 90% efficiency. And this is certainly far more than you need to run a Core i9-9900K at five gigahertz, for example. So the ASRock Z390 Tai Chi Ultimate has a very solid looking board and I'm very keen to see how it performs. But before we can do that, we have three more boards that we need to check out. And the next one on our list is the MSI Z390 Ace. This is a $270 US model and I believe it is the cheapest of the four boards we will be looking at in this roundup. I've skipped over the MSI Godlike since it's well, it's pretty stupid overkill. It costs a small fortune. And I suppose above all else, it is a limited run deal. So yeah, a limited edition motherboard. That then makes the ACE MSI's real flagship Z390 motherboard. And well, it's a pretty decent looking board. The heatsink design is very similar to what we saw on the ASRock board. You get two slabs of aluminium that are connected using a heat pipe. And then there's a few slots cut into them, but yeah, it's far from a finned heatsink. The heat sinks are also attached via four screws, though these ones aren't spring-loaded, and you get the same kind of thermal pads underneath. I should note, though, that the larger of the two heat sinks is almost completely encased in a plastic shroud, which is used to cover the I.O. headers. Uh, on board, we again find the IR35201 controller, and this time six phases have been dedicated to the V-Core. Each phase is again split using an IR3598 phase doubler, giving the ACE a 12 phase V-Core VRM. Unlike the godlike, we don't have integrated power stages, but rather separate high-low FETs. For the high side MOSFET, we have the 4C029N, and for the low side, the 4C024N. So for each phase, we have one of each component. These are on semiconductor MOSFETs. The high side is rated for a current capacity of 46 amps and the low side 78 amps, which I believe gives the phase a peak current capacity of 46 amps. On paper, the A should be a little bit better than the Tai Chi Ultimate, but of course we will have to go over the results in a moment and see what's what. Before we can do that though, we have another board to check out and it's probably the best looking board of the bunch. It's also by far the heaviest. And it is the Gigabyte Aorus Z390 uh, Master, or I think it's actually the Gigabyte Z390 Aorus Master. My rule about just two words, it's getting abused a lot with these product names. But anyway, uh, Gigabyte has been, I suppose you could say, down and out now for some time when it comes to their, their VRM game. Uh, we sort of saw a pretty ugly scene there with their B450 boards. Their new X399 board wasn't bad, but still not as good as we would have liked to have seen. But I think they're about to change all that with their new range of Z390 boards. Gigabyte's entire range of Z390 motherboards looks really impressive. And I will be testing out the cheaper models right down to the absolute cheapest model on the channel very soon. Today though, we have the Z390 Aorus Master, a $290 US model that looks incredible. 
This is a motherboard that impresses from top to bottom and the VRM is no exception, nor is the VRM cooling. Actually, let's start with the cooling. At first glance, I have to admit the board did uh, did trigger me a little bit. Gigabyte has covered almost the entire heatsink or the larger heatsink in plastic. Uh, and this really made my eye twitch when I first saw it. They do seem to be using the plastic as a shroud to direct airflow or through or over the heatsink, which I suppose isn't bad. I do question how well the heatsink behind the IO panel works, but ultimately the thermal results will speak for themselves, so I can only be so critical. At first glance though, the cooling doesn't really look that impressive. In fact, it looks quite unimpressive. You get what appears to be two aluminium bricks with a few slots cut into them like we've seen on some other heatsinks and then they're connected via a heat pipe. So what we're lacking here are some proper finned heat sinks. However, if we spin them around to the opposite side, we do actually find that they're kind of like hybrid heat sinks. We find some real finned heat sinks that are integrated into the backside of the aluminum slug. Airflow still looks as though it will be limited as the opposite side, the side without the proper fins, uh, doesn't feature that many cutouts, so you can only flows so much air through this heatsink and of course the top of it is covered in plastic. But anyway, it is uh, an interesting design, this hybrid finned heatsink design, so we'll have to see how it performs. Now removing the heatsinks is quite a large operation as the back side of the board features a massive, absolutely massive heat spreader or back plate I suppose, and it's not just there for show. This thing does remove heat from the back side of the PCB using thermal pads under the VRM components and it works incredibly well. Anyway, with all the heat sinks removed, we find another VRM controlled by the IR35201. And here we are taking six PWM signals from the controller for the V-Core VRM. Those signals are then each doubled using an IR3599 phase doubler, creating 12 phases, each of which is connected to an IR3553 power stage. These chips are rated for a maximum current output of 40 amps with a peak efficiency at around 15 amps, but will deliver over 90% efficiency at 25 amps. Even at just 25 amps, you're looking at a combined output of 300 amps, so needless to say, the Gigabyte board has some serious headroom built in. Okay, so the last board we have on hand for testing in this sort of four-way high-end battle is the ASUS ROG Maximus 11 Hero. And I actually had to buy this board. Asus weren't too keen on us getting one for testing. So yeah, I've just gone and bought one. Of course though, my luck being what it is of the four boards here, this is the most expensive one in Australia, not in the US. It's the same price as the, uh, I think it's the ASRock and Gigabyte boards, but yeah, it's $540 Aussie. So quite an expensive motherboard. But thankfully we have a lot of loyal Harbour Unbox Patreon members and well, they allow us to buy hardware like this when we have to. So big thank you to the Patreon members for allowing us to buy the Maximus 11 Hero for testing. I really wanted to test this board out for a few reasons. Firstly, it's the only high-end Z390 board to pack a four-phase VRM. And boy oh boy, did I cop some flack from the ASUS fanboys it seemed uh, when I pointed that out in a recent video. Actually, it's still up for debate as to whether or not this is a four phase board. Uh, well, it's not really up for debate because it is a four phase board, but if you argue with ASUS fans, you would be led to believe that maybe it's not a four phase board. So I guess it all comes down to what you class as an actual phase. ASUS called this a twin eight phase design as there are four signals, each going to a pair of power stages. So it's then a doubling of components, I suppose, which is, we've seen this before. In short, twin eight phase is marketing BS. Again, we've seen similar things in the past from Gigabyte and ASRock, and they have copped a serious amount of flack for it. So I'm not sure how ASUS is getting away with doing the exact same thing, or at least how they think they'll get away with doing the exact same thing. I'm sure ASUS fans will wise up to what's going on here uh, sooner or later. As far as I can tell, this is what the V-Core VRM looks like. The ASP1400 CTB controller is likely a rebadged IR35203 or an IR35201. Doesn't really matter as there isn't a second controller, so at best you'd be looking at a 6 plus 2 phase configuration. But because we have 10 power stages in total, 8 for the V-Core VRM, it's taking 4 PWM signals from the V-Core and 2 for the iGPU. Each signal for the V-Core is going to a pair of Vache SIC639 power stages, each rated for a 50 amp maximum current capacity, 
and at 90% efficiency around 25 amps. These power stages are running in parallel, so they do share the load, but it's not quite clear how well uh, load balancing works. But we do know they are switched on more regularly than they would be in an eight phase configuration, assuming the same frequency, and therefore will generate more heat. The main issue here is that ASUS is not being honest when they claim the Hero is a 10 phase board using an 8 plus 2 design. It's a fat 4 phase and nothing more. ASUS aren't doing anything special here, we've seen a doubling of components on many boards in the past. The Hero also seems to want to run in a 95 watt limited configuration and even with the power limit removed will reduce the uncore ratio to times 43 rather than times 47 used by all the other boards. I've tested the board with the default times 43, uh, which I won't be showing the results for that because that's unfair to the other boards, but I have tested that and it does reduce power consumption by a small amount and therefore it also uh, reduces the VRM thermal buildup. But for all the testing, I will be forcing the cache or uncore at 4.7 gigahertz rather than the default 4.3 gigahertz that the board tries to run at. Anyway, ASUS has gone with a very basic heatsink setup, which is comparable to what we saw on the ASRock and MSI boards. So I'm very keen to see how this thing performs. To apply load to the system, I'm not using a power bug type program like Prime95. For this test, I wanted to use a real world application, something you might actually run on these boards for an extended period of time. So I went with a blender workload that takes the 1900K an hour to complete. So the load results are reported after an hour of running the blender workload, and then the idle is taken after a 10 minute cooldown period. There are two tests in total. First, we'll be looking at stock results. So out of the box, 9900K performance without a 95 watt limit in place. Then a five gigahertz overclock using 1.3 volts. Both tests will be conducted twice, once on an open air test bed with no direct airflow over the VRM. Then we have a second test configuration inside the Corsair 500D with three 120 millimeter intake fans in the front, two 120 millimeter intake fans in the top and a single 120 millimeter exhaust fan in the rear. So the top mounted fans are pushing airflow directly over the board's VRM heat sinks. Then cooling the CPU is the Corsair H115i Pro, which was mounted in the front of the case. To record the temperatures, I'm using a digital thermometer with K-type thermocouples. I've placed multiple sensors on the surface of multiple power stages to measure the temperature across the VRM, and I'll be reporting the highest value. I'm also reporting the highest temperature I was able to record on the underside of the PCB. For the MOSFETs, this means I'm measuring the temperature directly on the top of the component between it and the thermal pad, and not an internal temperature, which is bound to be a little higher. Still, with all boards tested under the exact same conditions, that will give us a clear picture of how the VRM temperatures compare. And just finally, I'm not reporting delta T over ambient. Instead, I maintain a room temperature of between 21 and 22 degrees. I have a thermocouple sitting next to the test system monitoring the room temperature, and I have a special thing called climate control that maintains a target room temperature. And thanks to the way my office is insulated and designed, it works very well. It's important that I'm actually able to test this way and not use delta T over ambient. It doesn't work too well when I'm measuring performance as a higher room temperature will negatively impact performance. Today we are just focusing on temperatures so it's not such a big deal but when I was running these benchmarks or these thermal tests on these motherboards I was actually running benchmarks, uh, performance benchmarks with applications and whatnot and I may show that data in a future content piece. Anyway, we're already over 2000 words so I'd better get into the results. First up, we have the stock 9900K results on an open air test bed with no direct airflow. The Tai Chi Ultimate provided the best result here, cooling down to just 42 degrees 10 minutes after our hour long stress test had ended. The Aorus Master also did well, dropping down to 43 degrees, and the underside of the PCB's highest temperature recorded was just 39 degrees. MSI's Ace wasn't quite as good, but certainly not bad. And then we have the Maximus 11 Hero, which only cooled to 52 degrees, making it the hottest of the bunch. Not a terrible result, but it was 10 degrees hotter than the ASRock board. Okay, let's move on to see how things get under load. So it appears as though the Aorus Master comes into its own under load. Here the VRM peaked at just 53 degrees, and in fact, after just 20 minutes, the temperature had maxed out, and from there it maintained the 53 degrees that you see reported here. The Tai Chi Ultimate also does very well, hitting 57 degrees, though I have to say I was a little disappointed to see the MSI Ace reaching over 60 degrees, or just over 60 degrees. Admittedly, this is still a great result, but it is a very big step back from what the Godlike is capable of. 
Then we have the Maximus 11 Hero, which peaked at 70 degrees, making it by far the hottest of all the boards tested. That said, this is still a very acceptable temperature, uh, given that there is no direct airflow over the board. Though having said that, this is also a very cool room. And remember, we are measuring the surface temperature of the components and not the internal temperature, which is bound to be at least 10 degrees hotter. It's worth noting though that the ASUS and Gigabyte boards do share the same price tag, and yet the Aorus Master did run 17 degrees cooler under these test conditions. Moving on, I threw the boards inside the Corsair Crystal 570X. And again, the case was configured with a top mounted fan blowing air over the motherboard CPU socket area. In other words, it was feeding the VRM heat sinks with cool air. I'd say this is very much a best case scenario and no pun intended. Uh, what we have here is a well ventilated case, though I'm not saying the 570X is a high airflow case, but with the fan configuration used here, there is no shortage of cool air. Couple that with the reasonably low ambient air temperature and we have the perfect environment for a motherboard and its VRM. At idle, all boards ran well under 40 degrees. And remember, these results are reported 10 minutes after the hour-long stress test. Interestingly, the underside of the Tai Chi remained quite a bit hotter than the top side, and this wasn't an issue seen on the other boards. Moving on, under load, the Tai Chi again gets quite hot on the underside of the PCB. And in fact, quite shockingly, I measured the same temperature on the underside of the board as I did directly on top of the hottest power stage. The underside of the Maximus 11 Hero was much cooler despite similar VRM component temperatures. Still with plenty of airflow, the ASUS board ran at a reasonable temperature, though it was Gigabyte who delivered the goods, running an impressive 11 degrees cooler. So good stuff there, but I think it's now time to do some overclocking. Okay, so at idle on an open test bed with the 1900K overclocked to five gigahertz, we see very similar temps to the stock results and that well, that makes sense. We're really only adding a little bit more voltage at this point. That said, the Tai Chi is now hotter on the underside of the PCB, which is something we saw previously in the load testing, but not the idle test. Still, with the exception of the Maximus 11 Hero, all boards seem to operate between 43 and 45 degrees. So let's see how these boards handled after an hour long blender stress test. Doing so didn't actually raise the temperatures that much from the stock results. We see an increase of about five to seven degrees. Uh, the Gigabyte Norris boards saw a five degree increase while the MSI and ASUS boards increased by seven degrees. So nothing really alarming here. That said though, these results don't tell the full story, at least for the ASUS board. Again, the Gigabyte, MSI and ASRock boards all peaked after 20 to 30 minutes. And beyond that point, they were able to maintain the temperatures you see reported here. The Maximus 11 Hero though, it reached 70 degrees at about the 40 minute mark, and by the end of the test was at 77 degrees. However, it was continuing to slowly increase in temperature. The ambient temp remained the same, but ever so slowly the VRM was getting hotter and hotter. So I went back and retested again, and after three hours it hit 84 degrees, and I believe at that point it had stopped uh, increasing in temperature, but this will require uh, even further testing but of course all this testing does suck up a lot of time. For reference, I also rechecked the ASRock Z390 Tai Chi Ultimate and after two hours, it was still reporting the same 66 degree peak temperature. So thermal buildup doesn't appear to be an issue for these other boards. So that means if you plan on placing your 9900K under full load for very long periods of time, this is something to be aware of. In that case, I highly recommend the Gigabyte Aorus Master. Also keep in mind, this isn't necessarily a worst case scenario for the VRMs. They could certainly face much more abuse in a poorly ventilated case or a hotter climate or God forbid both. Moving on to what I consider a best case scenario inside the Crystal 570X, we see after 10 minutes of idle, all four boards are nice and cool. The surface temperature of the components on the Tai Chi are actually the coolest, while the underside of the PCB is the warmest. The underside of the Hero is also quite warm, uh, as is the surface of the components, at least relative to the other boards. Then once again, we find all four boards perform very well inside the Crystal 570X with plenty of direct airflow. Of course, the Gigabyte Z390 Aorus Master is an incredible standout here. And after what we've seen in the previous VRM test looking at X399 and B450 motherboards, uh, this is a really surprising result for Gigabyte, it has to be said. On the other side of that though, it is an equally surprising result for ASUS. Uh, it seems ASUS and Gigabyte have traded places. 
Okay, so some interesting results and overall no real duds amongst these four motherboards. Uh, some models were certainly better than others and just to clarify by dud I mean there were no you know, alarmingly high temperatures or failures of any kind. Uh, previously when testing B450 motherboards we found the flagship Gigabyte and ASUS models uh, hit unacceptably high temperatures while the ASRock and MSI boards did very well. Uh, then with the X399 boards, ASUS and MSI did very well, while uh, Gigabyte and ASRock didn't do quite as well, uh, at least when overclocking the 32 core monster that is the 2990WX. And for that test, that was actually our extreme stress test. So we were using a bit more voltage than necessary, but that's kind of the point of an extreme stress test. I wasn't actually able to conduct an extreme stress test with the Core i9-9900K as I simply couldn't keep it cool. I'd have to de-lid the thing, uh, file down the silicon, and bring an even bigger open loop cooler. Not exactly out of the box testing that. So what have we learnt? We've learnt that the ASUS ROG Maximus 11 Hero is beyond a shadow of a doubt a four phase motherboard. A fat four phase motherboard, but a four phase motherboard all the same. It works well enough, but is without question inferior to all competing boards of a similar price. And I suspect a number of boards that are even cheaper uh, will be better, namely those from Gigabyte. I'm also aware of other media outlets and even some pro overclockers who have managed impressive overclocks with the Maximus 11 Hero. But make no mistake, there are better options out there and all of them are easier to overclock with. Getting the Maximus 11 Hero stable at 5.1 GHz with my sample was seriously difficult and actually required more voltage than the other boards that I've tested. The use of a four phase VRM means poorer voltage regulation, more ripple and hotter operating components compared to what we've seen on the 10 and 12 phase boards tested here. It's actually pretty hard to believe you're getting this VRM for the same price as this VRM, but that's the situation when comparing the ASUS and Gigabyte Z390 motherboards. I should just note that if you are gaming and not placing all eight cores under a full load for extended periods of time, then honestly, all this doesn't matter too much. Any one of these boards will get the job done and should live a long and happy life. That said, if you're placing all eight cores under full load for hours on end and you're doing so on a regular basis, then I'd simply avoid the Maximus 11 Hero. For most of you though, I suspect it's fine. Still, having said that, if you're willing to spend almost $300 US on a motherboard, there are at least three much higher quality, um, much better options in my opinion, and none of them lie about their VRM phase count. If ASUS just came out and said the Maximus 11 Hero is a doubled up four phase board, and they think that's better for X reasons, uh, I wouldn't really have an issue with that. But lying to their customers and their fans just isn't cool. And while it seems, well, seems quite evident that some ASUS fanboys uh, might defend them no matter what, uh, this is still a four phase motherboard. No, it's a, it's a twin eight phase, you gigabyte ASRock and or MSI shill. <laughs> anyway, enough about the Maximus 11 Hero. It is what it is. It's not a terrible board. It's just probably not worthy of the asking price. At least in my opinion, uh, personally, I would be getting the Gigabyte Master, the Aorus Master, oh, such a heavy motherboard. And yeah, before you seriously go and try to call me a Gigabyte shill down the comment section below, just sit down and relax. Maybe watch some of our previous motherboard videos before passing that judgment. And if you can't be bothered watching our previous videos and you just want to go ahead and drop a comment saying we're just the absolute worst shills and fraudulent people on worse review. I don't know, whatever you guys come up with, something negative. Uh, you should just probably know that in a very recent content piece, we did name the ASUS ROG X399 Zenith Extreme as one of the best or the best original X399 motherboard and said that it's still one of the absolute best alongside the MSI Meg X399 creation. And I should note that ASUS didn't provide us with that sample either. If you care about overclocking and VRM performance, then I highly recommend you check out the Gigabyte Z390 uh, Aorus Master. Really amazing board, that one. And I'm, I'm quite stunned by how well it performed given uh, our last few VRM tests. The ASRock Z390 Taichi Ultimate, that's another very solid board. Uh, really nice board, that one. And it would be my number one pick if you wanted to use the 10 gigabit ethernet, because obviously that makes it a really 
really good value board. Uh, then we have the MSI Z390 Ace. Uh, yeah, that's another solid offering. It's a little cheaper than the other three boards, but not by a significant margin. I think it's about $20 uh, US. Didn't really stand out to me as being really special in any one area. And to be honest, I was hoping it would be a little more godlike than it turned out to be. Uh, next up, I'll probably test out the cheapest Z390 boards uh, by looking at the MSI Z390A Pro. Or, yep, that's it there. Yep, the Z390A Pro, that is correct. I wasn't sure if Pro was meant to be on the end. So I've got this board obviously on hand already. Uh, I have the, I'll just drag it over here, it's off to the side. The ASRock Z390 Pro 4, another Pro board for the entry level. Uh, I would also like to take a look at the Gigabyte Z390 UD. There's quite a few boards up here still out of shot. So I'll be testing that one as well. And then I will most likely have to purchase the ASUS Z390P. I believe that is the cheapest ASUS board. Uh, but yeah, I'll have to buy that one. So I've got the other three boards, which I can start testing now. I'll order the ASUS board early next week, get that on hand. And yeah, that's another one we can thank the Patreon members for, for supporting the channel and allowing us to buy hardware to test. And that is going to do it for this one. I hope you guys enjoyed our VRM testing, or VRM thermal testing rather, of these four motherboards. Some interesting results. Like I said, no real duds, but certainly some boards were better than others. If you liked the video, you know what to do. Subscribe for more content if you would like to see more videos just like this. And if you appreciate the work we do at Harum Boxed and want to support the channel more directly and allow us to do things like buy motherboards, then consider signing up to our Patreon account. You'll also gain access to our private Discord chat where you can chat. And you'll also get access to our monthly live streams where you can listen to Tim and I chat and chat in the live chat. So just a whole lot of chatting if you become a Patreon member. Thank you for watching. I'm your host, Steve. See you again next time.